In the name of the earth maker, pain bearer, and life giver. Amen. I think I've always assumed that wisdom was a kind of special insight about life and how best to live it that comes principally with age. The older you get and the more experience you accumulate, the more you come to understand what's really important in life and how to navigate your way through certain situations with a natural kind of grace and confidence. For example, I think about a recent conversation I had with my mother in which I was whining about how long it was taking me to finish the degree I'm working on part-time and that I would be 50 years old before I ever got there. My mom, never looking up from what she was doing, said, you're going to be 50 anyway, so shut up about it. (laughs) To which I had no response. That's certainly human wisdom, but I've been challenged this week to think about what our faith has to say about the source and nature of wisdom. I think it's clear that God's wisdom and human wisdom are not the same. Paul asks the community at Corinth, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? And in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Indeed. But what does it mean to be wise in the eyes of God? Our passage from Proverbs is what got me thinking about the question originally, but it isn't much help in answering my question. The personified wisdom invites the reader to a banquet. Come, eat of the bread and drink of the wine I have mixed, she says. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. That sounds terrific, but what does it mean to lay aside immaturity? Our reading from Ephesians gives us more insight. Be careful then how you live not as unwise people, and do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul's understanding is that wisdom is not the accumulation of human knowledge and experience, useful though they can certainly be. Wisdom is the ability to understand what the will of the Lord is. That is, we increase in wisdom when we expand our capacity to discern the will of God. So how do we discern the will of God? How do we access this wisdom? Of course, that is a question for the ages that will not be answered satisfactorily here today. My own journey over the last few years has been part struggle to answer that question for my own life. And so I hesitate to try and answer it, but I'll do it anyway. It seems to me that we start by acknowledging that our ability to access a greater sense of God's will is an act of God's grace. We cannot get there of our own doing. Proverbs 2.6 says that the Lord gives wisdom from God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Isaiah chapter 48 says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you for your own good, who leads you in the way you should go. God's will is revealed to us, and we depend on God's grace to help us understand it. Thankfully, God's grace abounds. God has not left us to wander in trackless wastes, as the psalmist says. God aids us in many ways. For example, in Scripture, God provides insights, if not explicit statements, of God's will. From our psalm today, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Isaiah chapter 1. Learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Micah chapter 6. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. 
I could obviously go on. God's will is powerfully revealed in Scripture. To access this wisdom, we will need to read, mark, and inwardly digest it, as Thomas Cranmer famously prayed. And we have a powerful ally and teacher in the Holy Spirit, lest we forget the third person of the triune God is here with us right now, always. Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit in John 14 and elsewhere, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Again, Paul tells the church at Corinth, we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us toward a better understanding of God's will. God has also given us the gift of prayer. If you want to know what God's will is on a subject, ask God. The psalmist prays, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. And in James, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. So, if we want to know the will of God, if we want to be wise, we should pray. But to me, God's will is most powerfully revealed in the incarnation. Jesus of Nazareth is the pure distilled embodiment of God's will. His life, his teachings, and death and resurrection all convey poignant statements about God's will. His life tells us something amazing about how, how God views humanity. That God would take human form and endure the vagaries and indignities of human existence conveys to us in the most profound way how much God loves us. His teachings establish love of others as the center of God's will for humanity. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. But not just a love that exists in the mind or even exclusively in the heart. It is a love that leads to action, to feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked and visiting the prisoner. It is a love that requires that unjust structures and systems be condemned and uprooted. And it is a love that insists that we cannot be separated from God, no matter what we have done or have not done. The barbarity and pain of Jesus' death proved how far God was willing to go to prove that love. And Jesus' glorious resurrection established that not even death itself could extinguish that love. Jesus is the fullest expression of God's will revealed to us. Therefore, Jesus is also the fullest expression of God's wisdom. Again, the Apostle Paul, we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We come to this table on a regular basis to be united to Christ through the sacrament of his body and blood. It is most probably often said that we do so to acknowledge his sacrifice and remember his death and resurrection. And that is certainly true. But in our gospel reading, Jesus says that those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Abide, present tense. We are also united to Jesus's life. And in that life, the way it was lived and the values it represents is the will of God. 
We become wise when we recognize that we do the will of God when we strive to live according to Jesus' example. But my question is not a purely academic question, I hope. Friends, I worry that we live in a time when the search for this kind of wisdom, God's wisdom, is on the decline. And the consequences for our society and world are devastating. For example, Jesus said, I came that they, meaning we, may have life and have it more abundantly. And yet I see death everywhere. It is contrary to the will of God for a person to die of COVID-19 because they refuse, if able, to take a vaccine that would almost certainly save their life. It's not smart because it's uninformed. It's unwise because God wants us to live. It is contrary to the will of God and, dare I say, plain old evil for people to dissuade others for taking that vaccine or downplay the severity of the disease or public health measures on the basis of half-truths or flat-out lies for political purposes or television ratings. It is contrary to the will of God for people to live in poverty and on the street. It is contrary to the will of God for people of color to continue to suffer the consequences of discriminatory public policy born of our addiction to white supremacy. It is contrary to the will of God for us to lower our heads and pretend that the social fabric of this country and its democratic institutions are not on the verge of collapse due to the purposeful and malicious actions of some of our leaders and their enablers. What does our scripture say about these topics? What would Jesus say about these topics? As much as we ever have, we as individuals and a church must continue to seek and do God's will. We must seek that kind of wisdom. And I want you to know, my rant notwithstanding, that I have hope. With God on our side, we do not fear. Many are already actively engaged in the work, and no one here is powerless. We all have contributions to make. Are we searching the scriptures? Are we praying? Are we asking ourselves regularly, God, what would you have me do? Or God, where can I do some good? Help me to know what to do. I know I can't solve all the world's problems, but I can do something. Only when we are in a continual process of discerning what those somethings are, when we are asking what we as individuals or as a church can do to follow Jesus's example, will we be able to claim some degree of wisdom God, help us to be wise. Amen.